Stan Gibalisco here. I would like to explain a little concept in my book, Teach Yourself Electricity and Electronics. I believe it's covered in all editions, but I'm referring to the fifth edition, edition number five, which I have before me right now. And the particular characteristic that I want to talk about here is called characteristic impedance. It has to do with radio frequency transmission lines. It's mentioned briefly in chapter 15 on page starting on page 252 if you have the fifth edition. But before we get into exactly what characteristic impedance is, it's one of those kind of esoteric concepts, a little bit like radiation resistance. Um, in this playlist, um, Teach Yourself EE Miscellany, I recently made a little video that explains uh, in rigorous terms exactly what radiation resistance in an antenna is. You might want to watch that video. You might want to go back and watch that one right now and then come back here. Otherwise, we can start right here with a basic diagram of here's a radio transmitter, like a ham radio transmitter, my ham radio, uh, which is going right now, by the way, here uh, down in my uh, little technophile paradise, which I refer to as the nerd cave. Lots of electronic equipment down here in just a few square meters of floor space in the cool dark basement in the Black Hills of South Dakota, United States of America. True power and imaginary power both occur when you have a radio transmitter and an antenna that isn't perfectly matched to its transmission line. But what does perfectly matched mean? Well, it means that the antenna comprises only resistance, no reactance. That's requirement number one. In order for a transmission line to be perfectly matched to its antenna, the antenna must be free of reactance. Usually, but not always, that means a resonant antenna, such as a half-wave dipole in free space. If that antenna has no reactance, then it exhibits a certain impedance which comprises entirely the radiation resistance of that antenna. Well, that antenna, this antenna right here, if it's a half-wave dipole in free space, theoretically will have 73 ohms of radiation resistance. That will be without any reactance at all. Well, if we connect a transmission line with certain properties to this antenna, we'll get no imaginary power in the line. So we will minimize the loss in the transmission line because we have a perfect ratio between the current and the voltage which remains constant all along the line. That is the ideal state of affairs called a perfect match. 73 ohms is, a, is, a, is what we want the ratio of the voltage in volts and the current in amperes to be. Remember Ohm's law. Resistance equals voltage divided by current. Well, if we have 73 volts, say, and 1 ampere flowing everywhere along this line, then it will have a characteristic impedance of 73 ohms. Characteristic impedance of 73 ohms is pretty easy to obtain in a coaxial transmission line. In fact, the cable television coaxial cable that you commonly find has a characteristic impedance very close to 73 ohms. Most amateur radio uh, coaxial transmission lines have characteristic impedance of 50 ohms. If we connect that here instead to the half-wave dipole, we will have less than a perfect state of affairs. We will have a mismatch between this 73 ohm radiation resistance and the 
50 ohm characteristic impedance of the transmission line. So the characteristic impedance of a transmission line that's written like this is a theoretical idea kind of like radiation resistance. It is the ratio of the voltage in volts to the current in amperes along a transmission line that is perfectly matched to its load and that is its antenna. Well the characteristic impedance of a transmission line depends upon its physical construction. Most coaxial cables as I said have characteristic impedance values of around 50 to 73, 75 ohms thereabouts. You can occasionally find some that has characteristic impedance of a little more than 73 ohms, I think upwards of 90 ohms. Let's look at a cross section right here of coaxial transmission line. There's the center conductor right there and there is the outer conductor, the shield or the braid of the coaxial cable. This is shaped like a tube, like a conduit, a cylinder, and that's normally a wire. And this medium in here, this white, is the dielectric, which is typically polyethylene, either solid polyethylene or foamed polyethylene, which serves to keep this center conductor centered inside of the shield even if you bend and twist and flex the cable. You've seen coaxial cable. You probably know pretty much what it looks like. And if you've worked with it, you know how frustrating it can be sometimes mechanically to work with it. Well, let's consider the radius of the inner conductor, the center conductor, and the inside radius of the shield. The characteristic impedance of this particular type of line depends on the ratio of R2 to R1. As, the ra as R2 divided by R1 increases, we can do that either by making this wire smaller, this shield bigger, or both. If we do that, all other things being equal, the characteristic impedance will increase. The so the, the smaller we make this, all of the things being equal, the smaller we make this center conductor, the higher the characteristic impedance will be. Similarly, the larger we make the radius of the outer conductor, all other things being equal, the larger the, radi the uh, characteristic impedance, pardon me, not radiation resistance, characteristic impedance of this line will be. It's always a pure ohmic number, like 73 or something like that. Well, we can also use a parallel wire transmission line. Um, if you're a ham radio operator, you've doubtless seen that. Here's a cross-sectional view. Two wires spaced a certain distance D apart, center to center, and they each have a certain radius. Typically, that radius is the same for each wire. And these wires are held at a constant spacing from each other, either by a ribbon of polyethylene, like so-called TV ribbon or twin lead, or by spacers, plastic spacers, acrylic or poly, uh, polystyrene, something like that, uh, something rigid. That's called ladder line because it literally looks like a ladder. Well, in that case, you can get a higher characteristic impedance with a balanced transmission line like this. As we increase the distance between the wires, leaving the everything else constant, the characteristic impedance increases. If we reduce this distance, it decreases. If we increase the wire radius, leaving everything else constant, then the ratio D divided by R, if we increase R, it'll go down and the characteristic impedance will go down. So again, the characteristic impedance is actually proportional to the logarithm of the ratio D divided by R. Over here in this unbalanced line, 
the characteristic impedance is proportional to the logarithm of R2 divided by R1. You can a typical characteristic impedance for this type of line is 300 to 450 ohms. Sometimes if you make the wires quite small you use mostly air as a dielectric you might get a characteristic impedance as high as 500 or even 600 ohms. So that's basically what the characteristic impedance is. It's uh, generally symbolized Z sub zero and it equals the ratio of the voltage in volts, that's E, we might call that E, the voltage in volts to the current in amperes. And you might recognize that as resistance in typical Ohm's law fashion. However, here it is an impedance number. It, reactance has nothing to do with characteristic impedance. It's kind of like radiation resistance. Once again, it's a theoretical construct. I recommend, if you want to learn more about all of this, if you really want to get into depth about it, get one of the publications from the ARRL, American Radio Relay League. Go to www.arrl.org and get their antenna book or their handbook or one of those books describes this, uh, this uh, theory and everything in a good deal more detail than my book does. But that basically is the concept of characteristic impedance. Again, kind of an imaginary theoretical thing. Have a good time. Get your ham radio license. Get on the air and meet me on the 14 megahertz band doing Morse code. My call sign W1GV Whiskey 1 Golf Victor. Signing off and 73 from Dakota Territory, United States of America. <laughs>